the Committee on Judiciary, Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, Civil Liberties will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. I welcome everybody to today's hearing on oversight of the Voting Rights Act, a continuing record of discrimination. Before we continue, I'd like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearing today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to judiciarydocs at mail.house.gov, and we will distribute them to members and staff as quickly as we can. Finally, I would ask that all members and witnesses mute your microphones while you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself at any time you seek recognition. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Last month, the Reverend Dr. William Barber from North Carolina reminded us in testimony before our subcommittee that our Constitution says that we must establish just justice. Our Constitution requires equal protection under the law, and our Constitution commands that you cannot deny or abridge the right to vote on account of race or color. When you suppress the right to vote, in essence, you are suppressing people's humanity. You are saying that they not, are not worthy of full citizenship. Unfortunately, African Americans and other racial, ethnic, and language minorities know what it is like to have their right to vote, that is, their humanity, and their full inclusion in our nation's body politic suppressed. Throughout our nation's history, federal, state, and local governments, as well as individuals and hate groups, have tried to undermine voting rights for minority voters. Civil rights leaders, like our late colleague John Lewis, put their lives on the line to ensure the right to vote for everyone. Their work led to the enactment of one of the most important civil rights measures in our country's history, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And while the passage of the Voting Rights Act did not end attacks on the right to vote, it did offer a powerful tool to prevent states and localities from implementing discriminatory voting measures or to overturn such measures when they had already been implemented. Since the Supreme Court's effective gutting of the act's preclearance provision in Shelby County versus Holder, states have introduced and in some cases enacted into law new voting restrictions. Before Shelby County, the act's preclearance provision required certain jurisdictions with a history of voting discrimination against racial and language minority groups to obtain approval from the Justice Department or the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia of any changes to their voting laws or procedures prior to such measures becoming able to take effect. This mechanism provided significant protection to minority voters by preventing potentially discriminatory voting practices from taking effect before they could harm voters and their right to vote. Unfortunately, in Shelby County, the Supreme Court struck down the geographic coverage formula that determined which jurisdictions would be subject to preclearance, meaning that the preclearance provisions remain inactive until Congress adopts a new coverage formula. Last Congress, the subcommittee held numerous hearings in which it gathered significant and extensive evidence of ongoing voter suppression since the Shelby County decision, especially by those jurisdictions that were once subject to preclearance. As a North Carolinian and former state representative, I have seen up close how the gutting of the Voting Rights Act preclearance formula has led to increased efforts to erode the right to vote. Before Shelby County, many counties within North Carolina were subject to the preclearance requirement. 
Once this preclearance requirement was effectively eliminated, the legislature moved quickly to pass a sweeping voter suppression law that a federal appeals court would later strike down because it intentionally targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. Sadly, that law was not the only voter suppression law my state enacted. There are ongoing legal challenges to a voter ID law that the state enacted in 2018 to implement a new state constitutional amendment. And other forms of voter suppression continue to impact minority voters' ability to vote in North Carolina. North Carolina is not alone in its efforts to restrict the right to vote. States across the country have enacted dozens of restrictive voting laws since 2013, including six states that have enacted restrictive voting laws this year alone. According to the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University Law School, as of March 2021, there have been 361 bills with restrictive voting provisions introduced in 47 states as part of this year's state legislative session. And those numbers have certainly grown since then. Many of these bills seek to, to <clears throat> excuse me, Many of these bills seek to make absentee voting or voter registration harder, reduce early voting, impose stricter voter ID requirements, or undermine the power of local elected election officials. In the absence of an effective preclearance provision, it is unsurprising that discriminatory measures continue to erode our democracy, undermining the voting rights of racial and language minorities and eroding our democracy. The way forward for Congress to address this latest form of discrimination and voter suppression is clear. A fully updated and improved Voting Rights Act. Congress must create a new coverage formula to restore the act's preclearance regime and strengthen its other provisions to improve our ability to combat discriminatory voter suppression. Our witnesses today will make clear how relevant our record of voter suppression from last Congress remains today and the need for congressional action. I thank our witnesses for joining us today and look forward to their testimony. It's now my pleasure to rec recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee for this subcommittee hearing, the gentle lady from Minnesota, Ms. Fishbach, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Voting is a fundamental right in the United States. The election clause of the U.S. Constitution gives state legislatures the authority to prescribe the times, places, and manner of holding elections. The 15th Amendment requires that states ensure that voting is accessible and available to every American. In 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act to overcome state resistance and barriers that prevented minorities from exercising their right to vote guaranteed by the 15th Amendment. Congress has reauthorized the VRA since its passage, most recently extending the law for another 25 years in 2006. However, at that time, Congress did not alter what is known as the coverage formula for the VRA, and so states and counties who had violated their citizens' voting rights in the 1960s and 1970s were still required to undertake onerous steps to update their voting laws regardless of their more recent record. In 2010, Shelby County, Alabama challenged the constitutionality of the VRA's coverage formula for subjecting them to these continued requirements based on conduct decades ago. It is worth noting that between 1965 and 2010, Shelby County and the cities and towns within it had submitted at least 682 requested election law changes to the Department of Justice in accordance with the VRA, and the DOJ had objected to just five of them. In 2013, the Supreme Court agreed that continuing to require states to pre-clear election law changes based upon conduct, conduct excuse me, from decades ago was an unconstitutional invasion of state sovereignty. In announcing its opinion in Shelby County v. Holder, the Supreme Court found that, and I quote, the conditions that originally justified these measures 
no longer characterize voting in the covered jurisdiction, end quote. Some of my colleagues argue that the court's opinion in Shelby County has unleashed a flood of state election law changes designed to disenfranchise minority voters. But this is a misunderstanding of the intent and a result of state election changes. Georgia recently in the news for its law to tighten election security after a very controversial election cycle has higher rates of African-American voter registration and participation, according to the Census Bureau data, than Democratic-controlled states of Illinois, New York, and California. Similarly, Arizona, another state recently under scrutiny for its election laws, has higher voter turnout among minority groups than neighboring California. Laws designed to increase election security and integrity are not the same thing as voter suppression or voter discrimination. After a very controversial election, many states should indeed re-examine their election laws for ways to promote greater voter confidence in our election system. The court's decision in Shelby County in no way invalidated existing voting protections in the VRA or other federal laws and authorities have continued to use these laws when appropriate. After the Shelby County decision, then Attorney General Eric Holder announced that DOJ would, and I quote, shift resources to the enforcement of Voter Rights Act provisions that were not affected by the Supreme Court's ruling, including Section 2, close quote. But there was no wave of enforcement because there was no wave of voter suppression. The Obama administration filed 75% fewer Section 2 cases than the Bush administration and similarly made use, made little use of other voting rights authorities. Therefore, there's no record that merits reinstating the Section 4 coverage formula and Section 5 preclearance regime as previous legislation has sought to do. Republicans want every legally cast vote to count. We want robust elections in our country where everyone has confidence in the outcome. I hope today we can have a productive conversation about the VRA and how we can best assist states in enhancing voter protections and, and preserving the integrity of our elections. And I wanna thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and I look forward to hearing all of the testimony and I thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Fishbach. It's now my great pleasure to recognize uh, the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. The purpose of today's hearing is to continue the subcommittee's oversight of the Voting Rights Act, in part by, re by revisiting the extensive record we compiled during the 116th Congress, documenting voting barriers in various jurisdictions. Indeed, since the subcommittee's hearings last Congress, states have only intensified their efforts to enact laws that suppress minority voting rights. To begin with, it is important to reflect on the origins of the Voting Rights Act as we consider how to amend the act to address the current barriers to voting faced by too many Americans today. In response to public pressure from the civil rights movement, the federal government took renewed interest in protecting minority voters. Starting in the late 1950s, the federal government engaged states and localities with a history of discrimination in a cat and mouse chase over their attempts to rob racial minorities of meaningful participation in the democratic process. Every time a court struck down a jurisdiction's discriminatory voting measure as a result of a successful legal challenge, that jurisdiction would simply implement another way to discriminate against minority voters in response. Meanwhile, as the case slowly uh, worked its way through the courts, racial minorities would continue to de be denied the constitutional right to vote. Congress sought to put an end to this in an unending cycle, uh, often referred to as the whack-a-mole, in which minority voting rights were the casualty by passing the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The VRA proved a potent remedy for the most egregious forms of overt voter discrimination, and the voting rights landscape changed significantly following its enactment. Under the, uh, the VRA Section 5 uh, preclearance regime, 
States and localities with a history of discrimination against racial and ethnic minority voters had to submit changes to their voting laws to the Justice Department or to a vote or to a federal court for approval prior to taking effect. While preclearance did not fully eliminate state attempts to discriminate against minority voters, it did end the cut and mouse chase, and minority voter registration and political participation increased markedly compared to its previously abysmal levels. In, in the decades following its initial passage, Congress reauthorized and amended the VRA several times on a bipartisan basis to keep pace with states and localities that still stubbornly refused to stop discriminating against their minority citizens. In 2013, however, the Supreme Court effectively gutted the Voting Rights Act's most important enforcement mechanism, its Section 5 preclearance provision, in its disastrous ruling in Shelby County versus Holder. In that decision, the court struck down the formula for determining which states and localities are subject to preclearance, effectively rendering the preclearance provision null and void. In her dissent, the late Justice Ginsburg compared throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes to throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Last Congress, we heard testimony from dozens of witnesses about examples of voter discrimination post Shelby County that illustrated this point. They testified that at least 23 states had enacted restricted voter lo voting laws since the Shelby County decision, including strict voter ID laws, barriers to voter registration, such as requiring proof of citizenship documents, allowing challenges of voters on the voting rolls, and unfairly purging voters from the voting rolls, reductions in early voting, and the moving or elimination of polling places. In fact, within just 24 hours of the Shelby County decision, both Texas Attorney General and North Carolina's General Assembly announced that they would reinstitute draconian voter ID laws. Federal courts later found that both laws were intentionally racially discriminatory. Unfortunately, these are just two of the most egregious examples of state and local efforts to discriminate against minority voters from the past eight years. Indeed, since the subcommittee began examining these issues last Congress, these efforts have only intensified. As of May 24th, the nonpartisan organization Voting Rights Lab is tracking 410 anti-voter bills at various stages of the enactment process. Dozens of bills that would curb minority voting rights have actively been moving through state legislatures, and six states have already enacted restrictive voting laws. Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, and Utah. These recent bills have been justified under the false pretense of addressing the baseless allegations of voter fraud in the 2020 election that had been promoted by former President Trump and his allies. Let me be clear. There is absolutely no evidence that significant voter fraud or voting irregularities in any way affected the outcome of the 2020 election. And it is clear that these laws will suppress minority voters. Prior to Shelby County, the Voting Rights Act had been an unqualified success in helping to reduce discriminatory barriers to voting and expanding electoral opportunities for people of color to federal, state, and local offices. While it continues to play an important role in remedying discriminatory barriers to voting, the VRA remains weakened without an effective preclearance provision. Too many Americans are still denied the right to vote because of their race, race ethnicity, or language minority status. Without the full protection of the VRA, the right to vote remains under considerable threat. I look forward to hearing from the excellent witnesses participating in today's panel on how we can best strengthen the VRA, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Chairman Nadler. Um, we are going to go right into our witness testimony right now and thank them very much for being with us this morning. We welcome our witnesses, and I will now introduce each of the witnesses, and after each introduction, we'll recognize that witness for his or her oral testimony. Please note, that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, that I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. 
to help you stay within that time. There's a timer visible on your screen in the grid view, and I may remind you. Uh, before proceeding with the testimony, I'd like to remind all of our witnesses appearing on that you have a legal obligation to provide truthful testimony and answers to this subcommittee and that any false statement you make today may subject you to prosecution under Section 1001 of Title 18 of the United States Code. Our first witness is Janae Nelson. Ms. Nelson is Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, Inc. She is also a member of LDF's litigation and policy teams and was one of the lead counsel in Beasy versus Ad Abbott, a federal challenge to the Texas voter ID law. Prior to joining LDF in June 2014, she was associate dean and faculty scholarship and associate director of the Ronald H. Brown Center for Civil Rights and Economic Development at St. John's University School of Law, where she was also a full professor of law. Ms. Nelson received a JD from the University of California, Los Angeles School of Law, where she served as articles editor of the UCLA Law Review. She received her BA from New York University. Upon graduating from law school, she clerked for the Honorable Theodore McMillan on the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit and the Honorable David Corr on the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Ms. Nelson, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Ross, Chairman Nader, and Ranking Member Fishbach, and members of the committee. My name is Janae Nelson, and I am Associate Director Counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Since our founding in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, LDF has led the fight to secure, protect, and advance the rights of Black voters. Despite the guarantees of the 14th and 15th Amendments, the Voting Rights Act and other federal statutes, racial discrimination and targeted suppression of the black vote persists. In the years since the infamous 2013 Supreme Court decision in Shelby County versus Holder, methods of voter suppression have metastasized across the country. By disabling Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the Shelby decision unleashed devastating attacks on the voting rights of racial and language minorities. But in that decision, Chief Justice John Roberts expressly invited Congress to update the act to respond to these modern conditions. However, in the eight years since, Congress has failed to do so, leaving voters of color and our democracy woefully unprotected. Our report, Democracy Diminished, State and Local Threats to Voting Post Shelby County v. Holder, which we have entered into the record, tracks, monitors, and publishes a record of discriminatory voting changes in jurisdictions formally protected by Section 5 and which Section 5 likely would have prevented. For example, in 2013, LDF sued the state of Texas to stop implementation of its stringent voter ID law, SB 14, the same law previously blocked by Section 5 in 2012 and that Texas revived within hours of the Shelby decision. The litigation produced multiple federal court findings that Texas's voter ID law violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, including a finding of intentional racial discrimination against Black and Latinx Texans. Although LDF and our partners succeeded at improving that law, by the time the case concluded in 2018, thousands of Texas voters had been disenfranchised in hundreds of local, state, and federal elections. In 2016, the largely white city of Gardendale, Alabama, attempted to secede from the more racially diverse Jefferson County School Board. Gardendale's secession would have transferred Black voters from the county school board's election system, in which Black voters have some representation, to Gardendale City Council's at-large election system, in which Black voters have no representation at all. The 11th Circuit blocked the secession in 2018 after LDF successfully proved that Gardendale was motivated by racial discrimination. Also in 2018, LDF filed a suit on behalf of students at Prairie View A&M University, a historically black university 
in the majority black city of Prairie View in Waller County, Texas. The city refused to provide any early voting location on Prairie View's campus during the first week of voting, even though it provided this opportunity to other voters. This denied Prairie View students an equal and adequate opportunity to vote. Although modest modifications were made, that litigation is still ongoing. Finally, in 2019, LDF and other civil rights groups sued to stop Florida from overriding the will of its voters enshrined in Amendment 4 by mandating that people with past felony convictions pay all their civil or other fees before registering to vote. However, the en banc 11th Circuit reversed the district court's favorable ruling, effectively denying voting rights of thousands of people with past felony convictions. Each of the discriminatory voting laws or changes in this representative sample would have been subject to preclearance. Instead, civil rights groups were forced to try to vindicate the rights of voters through protracted litigation. Litigation, while powerful, is a blunt instrument and elections occurring under conditions later found to be racially discriminatory have consequences that existing methods of defense cannot combat. The inability of courts to retroactively correct these wrongs means that thousands, if not millions of voters are disenfranchised during the pendency of litigation. We urgently need prophylactic legislation that allows federal authorities to stop discrimination before it infringes on the right to vote. It's unacceptable that in 2021, 56 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act by a bipartisan supermajority, the right to vote remains under threat and under protected. It is the obligation of this generation of lawmakers to respond to the call of the majority of Americans who support new legislation to protect the vote. Congress must once again use the power enshrined in the Constitution and entrusted to this body to ensure the franchise for all citizens and create a 21st century democracy that is representative of and responsive to our increasingly diverse nation. It is the obligation of this Congress to guard our democracy and to continue the work of perfecting our union by protecting the right to vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nelson. Our next witness is John Greenbaum. Mr. Greenbaum is the Chief Counsel and Senior Deputy Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law, where he is responsible for managing the committee's efforts to seek racial justice. He oversees the committee's legal projects on, among other things, criminal justice, fair housing, and voting rights. He previously served as director of the Lawyers Committee's Voting Rights Project. He also is a co-chair of the Voting Rights Task Force of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the National Umbrella Organization of American Civil Rights Groups. Mr. Greenbaum received his JD from the University of California, Los Angeles School of Law and his undergraduate degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Mr. Greenbaum, you are recognized for five minutes. Chair Ross, Ranking Member Fishback, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on oversight of the Voting Rights Act. As the Judiciary Committee addresses the issue of whether and how to respond to the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County v. Holder, which effectively immobilized the preclearance provisions of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act by finding its underlying coverage formula unconstitutional. In my view, Congress needs to respond to the Shelby County decision in a manner akin to the bill passed by the House last session, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I come to this conclusion based on 24 years of working on voting rights issues nationally at the United States Department of Justice and at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Since the Shelby County decision, the Lawyers Committee's own contributions to compiling this record of discrimination have been substantial and my testimony today provides an opportunity to introduce these contributions into the legislative record. These documents establish the following. First, the effectiveness and efficiency of Section 5 in preventing voting discrimination prior to the Shelby County decision. Second, the high level of voting discrimination since the Shelby County decision, especially in the jurisdictions formally covered by Section 5. 
Third, the whole of the Shelby County decision left in the federal enforcement team to combat voting discrimination. And fourth, the need for Congress to address Shelby County by enacting legislation that will prevent discriminatory voting changes from going into effect in places where voting discrimination is greatest. Since Shelby County, the Lawyers Committee has had to litigate voting rights cases more frequently than pr prior to Shelby County. And a substantial majority of these cases have involved jurisdictions that were covered by Section 5, even though less than half the country is covered by Section 5. Moreover, we have sued seven of the nine states that were formally covered by Section 5, as well as the two states that were not covered, but had a substantial uh, percentage of the population covered locally. In 2019, the Lawyers Committee uh, conducted a 25-year review of the number of times that an official entity made a finding of voting discrimination. This preliminary analysis of administrative actions in court proceedings identified 340 instances. We found that successful court cases occurred in disproportionately greater numbers in jurisdictions that were previously covered by Section 5. Voter turnout by race is, another, is an additional measure of the distance we have to go to in eliminating voting discrimination. In Georgia, Louisiana, South Carolina, and North Carolina, all of which were covered in Section 5 by Section 5 in whole or in part, and in these states where voter uh, data by race is available, in the November 2020 election, white voter turnout was substantially greater than black turnout in all four of these states. Section 5 was designed to, to prevent a specific problem, to prevent jurisdictions with a history of discrimination from enacting new measures that would worsen the position of minority voters, the concept known as retrogression. Section 2 is quite different. It evaluates whether the status quo is discriminatory and thus must be changed. The Section 2 results inquiry is complex and resource intensive to litigate. My written testimony identifies four examples from the Lawyers Committee's litigation record that illustrate why Section 2 is an inadequate substitute for Section 5. Let me discuss the most recent. It involves a law in Georgia, a previously covered jurisdiction enacted this year. The law SB 202 is a 53 section, 98 page law that changes many aspects of Georgia elections. It has spawned several lawsuits, including one the Lawyers Committee is involved in. But for the Shelby County decision, SB 202 would not have been allowed to take an effect until there was an opportunity to determine its impact of voters on color, of color. At least some aspects of SB 202 clear to be, appear to be clearly retrogressive and probably would not have been proposed in the first place, let alone passed. This is perhaps most clearly demonstrated by Georgia introducing several restrictions focused on voting by mail where these restrictions were adopted after the November 2020 election, where notably voters of color used absentee ballots to an unprecedented degree, and in the cases of black and Asian voters used absentee voting at, high, at higher rates than white voters. The eight years since the Shelby County, since the Supreme Court decision, Shelby County versus Holder, have left voters of color the most vulnerable to voting discrimination they've been in decades. The records in Shel the Shelby County decision demonstrates what voting rights advocates feared that without Section 5, voting discrimination would increase substantially. Without legislation like the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act that addresses the hole in the Voting Rights Act left by the Shelby County decision, our democracy is at grave risk. Thank you, Mr. Thank Greenbaum, for your testimony. Our next witness is T. Russell Noble. Um, Mr. Noble is a senior attorney for Judicial Watch. And from 2005 to 2012, he served as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, including five years in the division's voting section. He also previously was a legislative assistant for a member of the House Financial Services Committee. Mr. Noble received his JD from the Mississippi Sco Co College of Law and his BA from University of Mississippi. He served as a law clerk to the Supreme Court of Mississippi. Mr. Noble, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair, Chairwoman Ross and uh, Ranking Member 
um, <clears throat> Fishbach and uh, Chair Nadler and the other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opp opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as you, as Chairwoman Ross noted, I have been litigating and involved in election and voting cases dating back to 2005, uh, uh, including bringing cases against Prairie View a and in 2008 and being a part of the Section 5 redistricting case uh, involving the state of Texas uh, uh, around 2011. Uh, the committee has my written testimony. Um, I'm not going to rehash it all. What I would like to do is draw the committee's attention to three points uh, from H.R. 4 that was considered in the previous Congress. Uh, the first point is that um, H.R. 4 grants uh, 14th Amendment standing to the Attorney General of the United States, which is a sea change in the administration and the prosecution of constitutional laws in the United States. Uh, Shelby County and virtually none of the Voting Rights Act litigation preceding that ever had anything to do with granting uh, the Attorney General 14th Amendment standing to bring due process and equal protection claims. And I worry that, and I caution the committee about the significant impact that will have on both the department and the relationships between the United States and its and her states. Um, second point I would like to talk about uh, in HR 4 is the new coverage formula that has been proposed. I believe it's been the same proposed, it's the same formula that's been around since 2014, though I'm sure it's changed some. Uh, the new formula uh, actually sets up um, a, an incentive system so that activist groups will go around targeting jurisdictions and it replaces the previous data-driven metric for determining coverage under Section 5, which was struck down in, in, in Shelby. Now, Shelby, Shelby, it's important to note, wasn't, striking, wasn't struck down because it relied on data. It was a question about whether or not the data was adequate enough uh, based on 1965 to reauthorize Section 5 in 2006. And so the problem with the coverage formula proposed in HR 4 is it shifts away from a data-driven metric and moves to something called a voting rights violation or a voting violation. And that is very broadly defined. And as the committee may know, there are a lot of reasons why jurisdictions uh, uh, will settle a voting claim brought against it without any without any consideration as to the legitimacy of the claims. There's obviously political questions, public finance questions, and, 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 and good faith reasons to settle that have nothing to do with their view of the legitimacy of the claims. And the third point I'd like to draw to the committee's attention is the proposed nationwide coverage of Section 5 or a Section 5 light uh, uh, as being considered. Um, whatever you can say about uh, uh, the current circumstances of voting uh, litigation and voting rights issues and disputes, um, it's safe to say that if the circumstances weren't bad enough to provide Section 5 coverage nationwide in 1965, it's hard to see the, the data supporting driving or data supporting covering the nation, nation in Section 5 coverage uh, in 2021. Uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the committee, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Mr. Noble, and you get a gold star for coming in under time. So thank you for, for doing that so quickly. Uh, our final witness is Wendy Weiser. Ms. Weiser directs the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. Her program focuses on voting rights and elections, money in politics and ethics, redistricting and representation, government dysfunction, Maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, rule of law and fair courts. She founded and directed the program's voting rights and elections project, directing litigation, research, and advocacy efforts to enhance political participation and prevent voter disenfranchisement across the country. Ms. Weiser received her JD from Yale Law School and her BA from Yale Law School. She served as a law clerk to the Honorable Eugene Nickerson, um, a, of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Ms. Weiser, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, um, Chairman Nadler, Vice Chair Roth, Ranking Member Fishbach, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify on strengthening the Voting Rights Act, which is one of the foundational texts of America and a critical bulwark against discrimination in our voting systems. 
Unfortunately, in the eight years since the Supreme Court gutted the law's most powerful provision, the preclearance requirement, it has become clear that the remaining provisions are simply not strong enough to protect Americans from increasingly pervasive acts of discrimination in voting. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is urgently needed. Today, American democracy and our most cherished values are under attack from within, and core to that attack is a fierce assault on Americans' right, Americans' freedom to vote. As we've heard, as of March 21st, uh, 31st, the Brennan Center counted more than 360 bills to curb voting in 47 states this year alone, and we'll be publishing new larger numbers tomorrow. Many of these bills clearly target voters of color. They restrict access to voting options that voters of color used in recent elections, and they even empower poll watchers to harass or intimidate voters with fewer limits. These bills are being driven by the false and often racially tinged claim that the 2020 election was stolen, the same claim that fueled the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. And more and more proponents are brazenly admitting that their goal is to subtract voters from the electorate. Now, as of today, more than a dozen states have already enacted new restrictions and bills are actively moving in many more. We at the Brennan Center have been tracking vote suppression legislation for over a decade, and the current anti-voter attacks are breathtaking in their scale, their scope, and their speed. It is the biggest legislative assault on voting since Reconstruction. Although the problem has grown more acute, it is not new. Since Shelby County, we have found that attacks on voting rights are especially severe in states and localities that were previously covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. In my written testimony, I present recent evidence of racial discrimination in the voting process. It is overwhelming. For example, dozens of court cases have found that state and local voting laws and practices to be racially discriminatory, and some intentionally so. In a Texas redistricting case, for example, a three-judge court found that the record contained more evidence of discriminatory intent than we have space or need to address. Our research shows that since Shelby County, voter purge rates have soared, and the bulk of this growth was in counties that were previously covered by Section 5. In 2018, the median purge rate in those counties was 40% higher than in others. And in 90 out of 100 counties in North Carolina, for example, people of color were overrepresented among those purged. And I note that the Constitution does not only prohibit racially discriminatory voting restrictions where members of targeted groups have low turnout. Turnout is caused by many factors, including hotly contested races. We are also heading into the first redistricting cycle in more than half a century without preclearance, posing a high risk to fair representation for communities of color. These forceful threats to our democracy demand an equally forceful response. Congress has the power and the moral duty to stop these attacks, to protect Americans against further erosion of their rights, and to help realize the Constitution's vision of an inclusive democracy. The VRAA is extremely well tailored to combat these modern racially discriminatory practices consistent with the Supreme Court's guidance. It is more than justified by the record already before Congress. And while critical, the VRAA alone is not enough to address current threats. To fully counter the scourge of vote suppression we're seeing today, we also need the For the People Act, HR1. While the VRAA specifically targets race discrimination in voting, HR1 sets baseline national standards for voting access for all Americans. And it addresses other threats as well. Both bills enjoy broad and bipartisan support across the country and both are desperately needed. We strongly urge this Congress to work diligently to send an updated VRAA and the For the People Act to President Biden's desk for signature this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Weiser. Uh, we'll now proceed under the five minute rule with questions and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. And my first question is for Ms. Nelson. Ms. Nelson, according to your previous testimony, in the years since Shelby County, 
your organization has documented a significant increase in the enactment of discriminatory voting practices across numerous jurisdictions, including North Carolina, and including those previously covered by Section 5 preclearance. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund has also filed many successful lawsuits challenging these practices under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. However, is Section 2 litigation alone adequate to remedy such widespread voter discrimination? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, and the short answer is that no, Section 2 is wholly inadequate to prevent the deluge of voter suppression efforts that we see proliferating across the country. Section five operated as a, a gatekeeper for intentional discrimination and for retrogressive actions of states. It allowed jurisdictions to go to the federal government to ensure that any new voting change would not harm the status quo for minority communities in their jurisdiction. That was an incredibly powerful tool to ensure that elections would not occur and elected officials would not be elected to bodies to govern, to determine the fate and lives of people within their jurisdiction, and later to find out that the tool that helped get them there was in fact discriminatory and that election and any subsequent actions could not be undone. If we think about the work that Section 2 does, it is an after the fact tool to prevent a remedy and seek a forward uh, uh, acting remedy for past discrimination. Section 5 prevents that discrimination from ever occurring. So Section 2 is no replacement for Section 5, as powerful as it is, and as much as we utilize it, it is alone not sufficient to prevent racial discrimination in voting. Thank you very much, Ms. Nelson. Ms. Weiser, um, it suggested that one way Congress could avoid a lengthy debate um, regarding updated preclearance coverage would be to adopt a nationwide preclearance regime. Uh, what are your thoughts on this idea? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I believe that the approach taken by the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, a modern geographic formula for preclearance coupled with coverage of practices known to be discriminatory, has been very carefully tailored to address modern threats to voting consistent with the Supreme Court's guidance. And there is strong reason to fear that a nationwide preclearance approach would not survive a constitutional challenge before the current U.S. Supreme Court. Um, as you know, in the Shelby County decision, the court has made clear that there needs to be very strong justification to require states to submit their voting laws and practices for federal preclearance and strong evidence that this requirement addresses a real and current threat to discrimination in the voting process. And Congress has already amassed a wealth of evidence of discrimination in the voting process um, and in recent years that supports the preclearance requirements that are in the VRAA. And while I do agree that the problem of discriminatory voting requirements is now spreading nationwide, I think it would be very difficult for Congress to make a similar showing with respect to every voting jurisdiction and every voting practice nationwide, or at least one that would pass muster before the current U.S. Supreme Court. Um, so, and, and I do note that there is, as we have heard, even in the current VRAA, a nationwide preclearance provision that is tailored to a defined set of specific practices that are known to be discriminatory. And so there is a nationwide component in there already. Um, thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move to the ranking member, Ms. Fishbach, you are recognized for five minutes. Ms. Fishbach, we can't hear you. We'll give her just a second and um, we may have to come back to her. 
Um, Ms. Fischbach, we can't hear you, so I'm going to go to Chairman Nadler, and then hopefully you'll be ready when um, he finishes. So, Chairman Nadler, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Ms. Weiser, in striking down the VRA's coverage formula in the Shelby County decision, the Supreme Court emphasized that the extraordinary remedy of Section 5 preclearance must be justified by current needs. The court noted that the increase in minority voting, voter registration and participation in covered jurisdictions since the VRA's initial enactment demonstrated that preclearance formula did not reflect current needs. The court suggested that widespread voting discrimination was a problem of the past. How do voting laws and practices your organization has documented in the last decade demonstrate that despite what the Supreme Court suggested in 2013, widely widespread voting discrimination continues to exist to persist in jurisdictions obvious, uh, previously covered by Section 5, even before the court's decision in Shelby. Thank you, um, Chairman. Um, I, we have been documenting since both before and after the Shelby County decision, a growing push to restrict access to voting across the country and growing discriminatory voting measures at both state and local levels. In the immediate aftermath of the Shelby County decision, there was a flood of new state um, laws and even local practices that were immediately put into effect that had been previously blocked by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And you've heard an example um, already, um, two examples already um, uh, from Ms. Nelson, um, and that were put in effect only later to be challenged um, um, for years before being struck down as um, discriminatory. And I note that the VRAA is very well tailored to address these modern threats to voting that we're seeing today. Unlike the prior section four, the touchstone is not registration and turnout numbers. It is actual proven acts of discrimination that this Congress is amassing. And there are a lot of them in the records that have been out there today. Um, and uh, Ms. Nelson, do you see parallels between the current post-Shelby era and the unending cycle of voter discrimination litigation that defined the pre-VRA Section 5 era? Uh, absolutely. We were litigating cases well before Shelby County versus Holder and continue to do so after Shelby County uh, released a, a, a uh, just an onslaught of attacks on the right to vote. Uh, we saw literally the day of the decision, states that were previously covered under Section 5 resurrecting the same laws that the federal government had said were discriminatory and putting them into effect. Uh, if that doesn't indicate uh, the, the willingness of, of too many jurisdictions in our country to knowingly in, in implement laws that they know will discriminate against American voters, then I don't know what other proof we need. And so there is a direct line between the uh, efforts pre-Shelby and those that are now permitted post-Shelby. Thank you. Mr. Greenbaum, you note in your written testimony that an oft overlooked side effect of the Shelby County decision is the reduced number of federal observer appointments under the Section 8 of the VRA. Instead, DOJ has relied on so-called monitors to ensure jurisdictions with a history of discrimination uh, conduct the election process in a fair, conduct the election process in a fair manner that does not disenfranchise minority voters. Can you explain the difference between these monitors and observers and what impact the in reduction in full-fledged observers has had on the efficacy of voting rights enforcement? Thank you, Chair Nadler. Uh, there's a dramatic difference. Observers, federal observers, have a federal right to observe each step of the voting process to make sure that it's not it's non-discriminatory and fair uh, to all voters. So it's a very it's a very it's very powerful in terms of preventing any discrimination at the polls in the lead up to the election and on election day. And when I was at the Department of Justice, you know, I, I and did observer coverage, I saw that in practice. Uh, post Shelby County, when DOJ sends monitors out to the polls, 
those monitors do not have a right to be there. They, if a jurisdiction allows them to observe par parts of the process, that's okay, but a jurisdiction can, can throw them out uh, in much the same way that, that most people can be thrown out from observing, observing the election process. So that protection against discrimination that exists when you have the federal observers has gone away. And one of the things that we're seeing in some of the legislation that's being proposed in states this year are rules that are gonna make it more difficult for poll workers to be able to throw out um, partisan poll watchers who may be disruptive. I, I think in one state, Texas, they're even contemplating allowing uh, partisan uh, poll watchers to be able to videotape what's going on at the polls, which has a long history of uh, photographing and videotaping and be, being, being a measure that's been used to intimidate voters of color. Thank you, my time has expired, I go back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're gonna try Ms. Fishbach again. Ms. Fishbach, are you still with us? I am not hearing her, but we're gonna keep trying. Um, and we're gonna to move to Mr. Johnson. You are recognized for five minutes. I thank the uh, chair for um, holding this hearing. Racism is defined as a belief that inherent differences among the various human racial groups determine cultural or individual achievement, usually involving the idea that one's own race is superior and has the right to dominate others, or that a particular racial group is inferior to others. When the Europeans landed at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, they came with the idea that they were a superior race and the Native Americans known as Indians or even Indians were subhuman. And this idea of white supremacy was further evidenced with the start of the transatlantic slave trade just 12 years later in 1619, 401 years ago. Racism has never suddenly disappeared from the hearts and minds of the people it afflicts. And in fact, racism has been foundational and permeates the soil of America. It has manifested itself in the area of voting rights for non-white people in America. Because racism still exists in America, the racist knife of voter disenfranchisement is alive and well. And well. The lie of voter fraud in American elections is just the latest iteration. It has entrenched itself into the American psyche and proven resistant to fact checks and studies. The poison of Donald Trump's big lie has put our democracy in peril. The protections embedded in the 14th and 15th amendments to the United States Constitution enable Congress with the responsibility to pass laws that protect and enforce the sacred right to vote. I thank the chairman for continuing this subcommittee's commitment to upholding and protecting that fundamental right. Ms. Nelson, in your written testimony, you state that the Voting Rights Act preclearance process was, quote, successful at dismantling the continuation of Jim Crow subjection in the electoral arena. Can you explain to us why uh, the Voting Rights Act was so successful and how did it achieve success? That was uh, tremendously successful. In fact, uh, it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act was passed that our, our democracy really earned its name. And it fulfilled the promise of the 15th Amendment that the right to vote should not be denied because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Uh, and, and it advanced the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection under the law. And it did that in many ways. It, for example, uh, banned literacy tests that we know were used to disenfranchise African Americans. It provided protection through Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act by allowing uh, the government and 
civil rights organizations and individuals to bring lawsuits against tests and devices and any other method of uh, affecting the right to vote that ultimately resulted in discrimination because of race. And all importantly, it, it created Section 5, which uh, was a filter for discrimination in our society. And uh, not only did it allow a federal district court in DC or the Department of Justice to examine new laws in certain jurisdictions, it also had a chilling effect in those jurisdictions and made them think twice before they would introduce a law that could potentially have a discriminatory impact on uh, African American and other marginalized voters. So well, let me stop. Let me stop you right there and turn your attention to the fact that in Georgia, premised upon the big lie, in Georgia and in other states, um, laws have been signed into uh, operation. Uh, and I'd like for you to describe how those laws, uh, based on not having Section 5 preclearance uh, requirements, how these laws are acting to suppress the votes of Black people and people of color in America. Yes, uh, we are actually in engaged in litigation in Georgia because of the law that was recently passed that on many aspects, but particularly mail-in voting. And we know that that is a direct result of the fact that many African-Americans availed themselves of this all important tool uh, and, and widely embraced tool to vote up until recently uh, because they turned out in record numbers. And this was a direct backlash to that impressive turnout and that impressive exercise of the fundamental right to vote. The Georgia law also limits the ability of people to receive sustenance as they wait online to vote. It criminalizes uh, the provision of water and food to voters as they uh, wait to exercise their right to vote. The, the very targeted way in which that law responded to the turnout uh, and the particular challenges that face African-American voters in Georgia uh, is a reveal. And the particular process that was used to enact that legislation also demonstrated that the legislature was willing to do all it could to get this bill passed with no transparency, virtually no public comment, uh, and, and, and no rigor as to how it would affect Georgia residents. And that is but one example of the very many bills and laws that the Brennan Center does such an excellent job of tra tracking and that we're seeing proliferate across the country. Thank you. And my time has expired and I yield back. Thank you so much. We're gonna try Ms. Fishbach again. All right, can you hear me now? Yay, great job. You, you are recognized for five minutes. And thank you, Madam Chair, for your patience. I appreciate it. Uh, um, you know, remote uh, internet is always a challenge. Uh, so, and now I'm on I'm on my phone, so using my phone today. But, um, and thank you again. I just wanted to um, ask Mr. Novial a couple of questions, um, if I could. You know, uh, in your opinion, do you think that states have used the Shelby County decision uh, to institute measures that um, amounted to voter suppression or, you know, did did covered states uh, wait until after this decision to institute changes to voting practices um, that would have previously been blocked by the preclearance regime? Uh, that's correct, Congresswoman Fishbach. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I enforced Section 5 in the voting section for six years. I've represented covered jurisdictions in my time since then. And, and really, you know, Section 5 was effective, but um, what it did was increase regulation in, in order to stop discrimination and it increased cost to make minor changes to voting laws. And so it, there really is no surprise that following Shelby, uh, there was a flood of, uh, of laws that people had either delayed or been thinking about implementing uh, uh, but just didn't because the expenses would have been so much. So, uh, uh, you know, the degree of that and how many of those there are, I, it's tough to say, but um, just because things uh, were implemented post Shelby doesn't mean they were uh, 
done with discriminatory intent or effect or, or retrogressive effect. Well, thank you very much. And, and I just wanted to ask you if you did have, um, you know, anything else to add. I know you've been listening. And um, if you had anything to add to some of the questions that have already been asked, uh, maybe, you know, from your opinion, on your opinion. Well, I mean, I think everyone's got different views on election integrity. Some people think it's inherently racist. Some people think it's a, a, a good to have procedures to ensure chain of custody and ballots and to make sure that there's proper observation in the electoral process. Um, as you know, as everyone knows, uh, Arizona is undergoing an audit as we speak right now. There was a series of letters from the Secretary of State and the sum of some of her complaints was that there was an inadequate chain of custody of the ballots during the auditing process. And basically what she's arguing is that there's inadequate chain of custody post-election through the audit to, to justify the legitimacy of the audit. Uh, uh, which is honestly some of the very same things that people have been saying pre-election. There's concern about chain of custody, ballot drop boxes, and how these things are being used. No, uh, um, you know, maybe there's someone out there, but most of the people don't have a problem with the drop box. They have a problem with the drop box that isn't monitored because they want to make sure uh, uh, um, there's, you know, no malfeasance. Um, as everyone knows, I mean, um, politics and elections don't bring out always the best in human nature. And politics and elections are a form of human competition. And for at least 2,500 years uh, 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 over the history of democracy, people have been using whatever they need to do to get a competitive advantage in the election. And uh, uh, people cheat and humans cheat in a variety of contexts, whether it's cheerleading competitions, sumo wrestling, or the Kentucky Derby recently. Uh, uh, people are going to do whatever they need to do to get a competitive advantage. Now. Uh, I suspect we all disagree on the quantity of that, but I, it's, it's, it's confusing to me uh, as someone that's actually sat and observed elections firsthand to, to see why uh, the context that brings out some of the worst behavior in human, human behavior, uh, uh, suddenly there, there is no cheating or people trying to get a competitive advantage. And, uh, um, you know, whatever people's disposition towards election integrity, I mean, I think human nature shows us that people will strive to get a competitive advantage in the electoral process. And so it is appropriate to have measures to try to ensure the legitimacy of the vote. Um, and I, I, I honestly believe that the Civil Rights Era, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act was a, a, a voter integrity measure to some extent because uh, the legitimacy of the elections uh, was suspect um, in the 60s and before then because, um, you know, large swaths of the American South were not allowed to participate in the electoral process. And so it's tough to, tough to, tough to evaluate human um, or popular, popular opinion without uh, uh, having people vote. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Fishbach, yeah. I, I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh Ms. Fishbach, we can't hear you. Are, are you yielding back or are you? I'm sorry. I guess it muted automatically for some reason. And I, and I apologize. And, um, and uh, thank you very much. My time has expired, so I yield back. Okay, thank you. And I see we have Mr. Raskin. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Ms. Ross, for uh, calling this important hearing. I want to pick up with uh, something that Mr. Um, Nobly just said. Um, the, the um, and, and perhaps Ms. Nelson, you could you could address this, um, and and I appreciate uh, Mr. Nobley's candor about this because sometimes what we get from our friends on the other side is a denial of um, the history of disenfranchisement and suppression of uh, the right of people to vote. And he seemed to acknowledge that, and he and he also seemed to acknowledge that it would come back again if we don't do anything to stop it. He attributed it to human nature. Uh, Mr. Johnson attributed to um, our history of racism and political white supremacy in the country, but we are already seeing it coming back. And uh, Ms. Nelson, let me ask you about Georgia. And we know that there are these hundreds of bills across the country that are meant to dismantle early voting or weekend voting or make people go out and get a notary public before they ask for an absentee ballot or whatever. But in Georgia, they've already signed into law a bill making it a crime punishable by up a year and uh, up to a year in jail to pass somebody a bottle of water or a chocolate chip cookie who's been waiting in line for six hours to vote. And so you say um, correctly, this will have a disproportionate effect in 
African American communities where I think it's been shown the lines are longer in uh, a lot of the minority communities. So let's say a state comes up with a law like that, which will definitely have a severely disproportionate effect on the minority community. In the wake of Shelby County versus Holder, Ms. Nelson, what can you do as a lawyer to stop it? If everybody agrees, if a reasonable person would agree that this is targeted at the minority community, what can you do to stop it? Does preclearance work anymore or can you go get an injunction against it? What can you do? Uh, well, if Section 5 were in place, uh, we would have that law screened by the federal government. There would have to be an examination by a federal district court or the Department of Justice. And the, the analysis would be whether minority voters are put in a worse position as a result of the passage of that law. And I think the answer would be a resounding yes. As you mentioned, minority voters uh, are, are, are exponentially more likely to have to wait in long lines, to have to endure obstacles uh, for a variety of reasons um, as they try to exercise the fundamental right to vote. And there have been studies in Georgia that show that Georgia voters waited in longer lines uh, this past election and in previous elections. And so this type of targeted legislation that makes that weight, makes that burden even more difficult and more onerous to bear uh, is, is something that I'm certain a federal court or a Department of Justice that was doing its job would recognize puts minority voters in a okay. good place. We now- right. I'm sorry, so, so and now, what, what do you have any means in your arsenal to deal with it now? Yeah, we can use section two as, as we are and, and the constitution to bring litigation to try to seek injunctive relief, but that is a very, very high bar. Uh, courts are not inclined to grant injunctive relief uh, without a very significant showing of a likelihood of success. Um, and the hope is that that injunction would uh, be granted before any election occurs. Uh, that that's not something that we can rely on. And sure. In fact, that, isn't there isn't there a canon of construction where the courts favor not getting involved in an election before it occurs? And you see what's happened with the removal of Section Five is the burden's been put on the voters all over the country in Georgia, in Alabama, in Texas, in California, wherever it might be, to go and get a court to get involved and to overcome all of the burdens in doing that, as opposed to simply the Department of Justice or a federal court looking at what their plan is and then examining whether it's got a discriminatory effect. Well, um, let, let, me, uh, let, let me go to Ms. Weiser. Um, if, if we do adopt this uh, attempt to save the pre-coverage formula, um, where um, you know, now we're covering based on proven voting rights violations, um, I think that uh, Mr. Nobley has already given us a preview of what the right wing attack on that is going to be. They're going to say, well, um, there are a lot of reasons that you might have uh, adjudicated cases of violations. You, you know, they might just want to settle the case and so on. So what is going to save us from the Supreme Court just, uh, again, finding another reason to strike it down the way that they did in Shelby County versus Holder? And that leads to, I guess, my final question, which is, do we need a constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to vote so we're not constantly playing whack-a-mole or hide the ball with people who fundamentally don't want to allow huge populations of Americans to vote? Uh, Ms. Weiser, uh, Mr. Raskin's time's expired, so if you could do it in 10 seconds, it would be great. I think the last one's a yes or no question. <laughs> Um, the, the last one is um, that would certainly help, but I don't think it is necessary because um, under properly interpreted under current doctrine, the Constitution does protect the right to vote, um, not only through multiple amendments, but also um, through the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, on the um, proven cases of discrimination, I think the um, Mr. Nobile's um, objections seem to only be to the settlements prong. I think that there aren't other reasons why there would be judgments or, um, uh, and, and I do think on, on the settlements, if they are excluded 
then you will certainly lose a bunch of instances of discrimination. This is something that Congress can balance the incentives on both sides. Um, and and you know, that, that. Thank you for doing that. And um, Ms. Garcia, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's great to see you at the gavel and to the ranking member. I'm so sorry about all the technical problems. I know I've had them, so I know that uh, it's uh, we all have to work together through all these, even though we've been doing it now for, for almost a year. We still seem to have some of these difficulties, but I want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for putting this great panel together in, in, on this very important topic. It's important that, that, that we note that the Voting Rights Act in its history, as my colleague Representative Raskin has, has mentioned, has a rich history of, of the need for the, the act. And it is, as some of, one of the witnesses said, it kind of puts a, a, a ribbon on what our democracy is because it is in fact the, the right to vote that helps us protect all our other rights. So that's why it is so important uh, that we have uh, this discussion because it's not really just about protecting the rights to vote for Latinos and for African Americans and, and Asian Pacific and Americans, it's to protect everyone's right to vote. So even when attempting to register, organize or assist voters in registration, uh, sometimes it's meant risking our jobs, it's meant risking our, our lives, it's meant uh, putting our homes and ourselves at risk. Uh, but people have a right to vote, and we better make sure that they can exercise that right. It's unfortunate that even with this rich history that we fast track to today, we are still finding these assaults on our democracy through, through assaults on the right to vote. I has been mentioned already by many of you and some of my colleagues, Texas regrettably, regrettably is a leader in this area. Our Republicans today are in Austin legislating and has been mentioned, Georgia has passed some laws. Now Texas is trying to mirror passage of all those laws to restrict the right to vote and making it harder for communities of color uh, and people uh, to be able to cast their ballots. So in light of this attack on voting rights and extreme concerns about the impact to our communities, it is important uh, that, that I share with you and I ask for unanimous consent to add to the record a letter from the Texas Congressional Delegation to the Department of Justice to provide uh, what actions the department may take to review and challenge these laws from Texas should they become law. Session's still about three or four more days to end, so we will know soon just what we'll have to challenge. The 2020 election has uh, repeatedly shown to be secure, safe, and accurate, and in, te and in Texas, this last election brought the highest turnout in 30 years. So it's no surprise that we're seeing all these additional uh, suppression and, and, and intimidation through the ballot, through these laws that are being proposed. So I implore my colleagues from across the aisle in Texas to stop, stop attempting to suppress the minority vote and let the people vote. That is the core of our democracy. So I think it's high time that we pass the John Lewis Act. I also, uh, Madam Chair, wanted to uh, include a uh, unanimous consent for a, a letter uh, from the congressional delegation to Majority Leader Schumer, urging him to, to pass um, their companion bill. Uh, also, of course, a copy of my written testimony from June 2014 when I was a state senator when I spoke before the Senate Judiciary Committee on updating the Voting Rights Act in response to the Shelby case. So, I, Madam Chair, I ask for unanimous consent. All great additions to the record. All right, thank grant. you, ma'am. So I want to start, Ms. Nelson, with you. You know, Mr. Raskin put you through some of the, the, uh, the items that have been passed in Georgia. I'm sure you're keeping track, uh, as many of you all are, uh, of the bills that are being proposed in, in Texas. And, and the question becomes, you know, how are we going to really be able to challenge it? What would be the cost of litigation should we choose to challenge uh, any one of these bills that unfortunately at least a couple of them are getting through? Uh, if we can do it under Section 5, and then we've got to use the constitutional basis. It's a hard bar, uh, as you said. But what about the cost? I mean, can your average litigant afford this? Uh, that's an excellent question. And, and just in brief, no, uh, these cases 
cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and sometimes into the millions in, to litigate. Uh, as some, many of my colleagues on this panel know because we were all involved in the VC versus Abbott case uh, and that litigation is uh, has wrapped and we're dealing with attorney's fees and they are significant. It takes enormous resources to challenge these laws and the complex bill that Texas uh, is, is attempting to pass would require uh, uh, an intense amount of time, money and commitment to challenge it. And it's not something that the average voter is likely to be able to do on his or her own. Uh, and it's very challenging for civil rights organizations like ours to continue to bear the burden of uh, protecting our democracy from these assaults and from these uh, discriminatory laws. So it is, it is, we absolutely need uh, prophylactic legislation that would prevent us from the need to litigate at this, at this clip and at this scope. And it takes a long time, doesn't it? It takes a very long time. And during that time, elections happen and uh, leaders are elected under discriminatory conditions. Uh, that cannot be how Nelson, our- Nelson, we're gonna need to have you wrap up because we're going over time, so. Okay. Thank you. That's not how our democracy can continue to operate. Well, thank you again, and thank you to all the groups. Uh, uh, without you, uh, we could not get some of these things done. So thank you for your work, and I yield back. Okay, and without objection, all of your um, additions to the record are added. Um, finally, you. we have um, Ms. Jackson Lee, and Ms. Jackson Lee, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thank you to the witnesses uh, for their testimony. Uh, I was uh, openly uh, want to submit uh, five articles into uh, the record and would like to specifically read a quote uh, into the record. Um, one article says, uh, racist voter suppression, Texas uh, laws keep Latinos from the ballot box. Uh, and uh, a particular quote, Texas has a long history it's a state that has the most pronounced overt racist voter suppression tactics that we know of. I can assure you that is extremely accurate in much of that my district is a voting rights district. Uh, it has been a voting rights district uh, since Barbara Jordan went to the United States Congress. And it has been a voting rights district since I was elected in 1994. Uh, but for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Council, uh, this district uh, would be the target along with others uh, for uh, extension. Right now, we are in the line of redistricting and we are likewise uh, the target. So I wanna ask uh, these questions um, and I cannot, Madam uh, Chair, see the time. So I appreciate your help. I'd like to ask this to uh, Mr. Greenbaum and I'd like to ask the question as well to Ms. Nelson, uh, if you would. Uh, there is uh, obviously a discussion about the uh, practical aspects of voting, uh, and that is uh, mail ballots, uh, ballot locations, uh, re-enfranchising felons. Those are all very important, and I advocate for them strongly. Uh, even uh, there is an idea of a, of a uh, voting uh, or a redistricting commission, uh, which one would also note that it may not be a perfect commission in every state. Tell me uh, how uh, pre-clearance section five, Mr. Greenbaum, in particular, um, indicates uh, that the uh, efficiency of section five is the element that gets to stopping what is voting discrimination at the door uh, and how relevant that is in comparison to forcing the section two um, procedures. And also if you would, uh, the uh, former president routinely undermined election integrity. He did it in the election in 2020. Considering these base attacks on election integrity, equity, can you explain what is at stake uh, if we do not address the Supreme Court's gutting of the Voting Rights Act? I'd like both of you to answer that question. Realize that my time is probably already gone. Madam Chair, I asked to submit five articles into the record. I Without objection. That. Thank you. And so both of you to ask that question uh, quickly, please. Sure, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Uh, Section five is effective and efficient because number one, it stopped voting rights 
discrimination before discriminatory changes could be put into effect. Employing a pretty straightforward retrogression test, are voters of color worse off under the change than they were before? And you know, in comparison to that litigation uh, under Section 2 or other causes of action is time consuming and expensive. Going back to the Texas ID case, as an example that it took us three and a half years to successfully litigate. And during that time, there were a lot of elections that took place um, under the discriminatory law. And then at the end of it, um, the, we recovered over $6 million in fees. That's now on appeal. And the state as of 2016 spent three and a half million on its own, not to mention the expense of the Department of Justice. Uh, democracy, uh, hey. and, and really quickly in terms of your second question, I, I really think democracy is at risk, at serious risk right now. And I think some of the laws that were seen enacted in a number of states, you know, we'll see what happens in Texas over the next couple of days. Uh, it, it's really scary. And um, as I alluded to in my, my testimony, I think the Georgia law is a great example of that, that all of a sudden after a number of years um, of having vote by mail in Georgia, it's after the election in which black, in particular black and Asian voters turned out in large numbers uh, in terms of voting by mail and in bigger numbers than in white, than white voters, Thank that you. all of a sudden you have these restrictions. Thank you. Can I quickly go to Ms. Nelson? And as you answer the question, remember preclearance for uh, drawn congressional district a preclearance as opposed to a section two action, why, why, why uh, the John uh, Robert Lewis bill is so crucial in restoring section five. Ms. Nelson? Again, very briefly, we've run out of time. So thank you, madam. I cannot see the clock where I am. Thank no, you. No, that's so okay. Much. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, we've talked about uh, the durability of some of these discriminatory uh, laws and, and decisions and, and how elections take place. Uh, in that time frame that we're challenging and litigating them. But I think in the redistricting contrast, in the context, it's even more acute. You have lines drawn that often last the better part of the decade of redistricting uh, that, that entrench power in a way that is not easily undone. And if we don't have a gatekeeping mechanism, if we don't have an, a, the ability to examine these redistricting plans before they go into effect, um, it, it will certainly wreak havoc on our democracy and, and severely undermine the legitimacy of it and of those elected officials who ultimately are produced based on discriminatory redistricting plans. Thank you so very thank much, you. Madam Chair. Thank you so very much. I yield back. Thank you. And. Um, is Ms. Bush here? I don't know, I haven't seen her. Um, if she is not, then this concludes I, today's I'm hearing. Here. Oh, are you here, Ms. Bush? <laughs> yes, yay. Okay, you are recognized for five minutes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and St. Louis and I thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for convening this hearing. Um, to all of my colleagues here today and elsewhere, we are running out of time. Republicans have been scrambling to suppress votes and they are doing so with urgency. As of March, more than 250 laws have been introduced in at least 45 states aimed in doing one thing, which we all know, silencing the voices of black and brown and indigenous voters. From Georgia court challenges to the, um, Georgia court, court challenges to the 2020 elections, to the ongoing election audits in Arizona, Michigan, and New Hampshire. The Republican Party has planted their flag and it is squarely in the camp of undermining our right to vote. But this is not new and it will not change if Congress neglects our duty to protect the rights of all people, not just white people to vote. I want to highlight three things today. First, which I know has, has been stated, the preclearance formula. 
a key element of the Voting Rights Act, which required many states to get federal approval to change their voting laws, is not enough. In fact, several states like my own my own state of Missouri have not previously been covered by the preclearance formula. Our Republican controlled state government has made clear in recent years that it is committed to surgically suppressing the votes of non-white Missourians, including in predominantly black communities like St. Louis. Missouri's obstructive voter ID laws have disincentivized thousands of people from even trying to vote. Second, we cannot solely rely on the protections of Section 2 of the VRA, which prohibits discriminatory voting laws. Section 2 is reactionary. It can only be used after states implement their racist voting laws instead of protecting those rights on the front end. The Shelby um, v. Holder decision made clear that those Section 2 protections are not enough. And finally, it is precisely because of these debates that H.R. 4, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act, must be accompanied by H.R. 1. has to be which addresses many voter protections, such as preventing voter purges and long wait times and expanding early voting nationwide. As Ms. Nelson mentioned, we cannot rely on the courts to retroactively fix these issues. We have to stop voter suppression before it happens. For those of us in Missouri who were not covered by the preclearance formula and those of us who live in states with a clear pattern of voter suppression, the protections put forward in HR1 are crucial. For these reasons, I call on my colleagues in the Senate to urgently pass this legislation. So Ms. Nelson, the record here is extensive, but can you please briefly highlight the most problematic changes to voter laws and practices that states have enacted since Shelby County, including states like Missouri? Uh, there are so many, but I will try to uh, pinpoint the ones that I think are, are particularly uh, uh, deleterious. Uh, certainly voter identification laws that are targeted to exclude uh, minority voters and that are designed by their particular requirements to make it more difficult to vote. Uh, registration limitations that uh, not only limit the ability of uh, parties, third parties to help register people, um, they have a deterrent effect on voter registration drives and get out the vote efforts because people are concerned that they may be violating laws and ultimately prosecuted, making voter registration more difficult through needing to produce identification or uh, to request an absentee or mail-in ballot witness signature requirements. And uh, uh, those types of means of making it just so much more challenging to just access the ballot. And all of this has been greatly exacerbated by the pandemic, where we're putting people at risk if they need to have contact with a third party or go to an administrative office in order to register or exercise the right to vote. Uh, there are many other ways in which our voting laws are limiting the ability to turn out and vote. We talked about uh, the criminalization of providing sustenance to voters as they wait. We talked about the idea that many early voting places have been cut short. The hours are not consistent across the country and across even state jurisdictions. There are not often the uh, adequate and equal allocation of voting machines and voting apparatus. I could go on and on. There are so yeah. many ways I mean, in yeah. which our democracy is not equitably uh, administered. Thank you. Thank you. I know you can go on and on. I just have one more quick question. Thank you for that. Well, I think my time is up, but um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Bush. We're thrilled that you made it and um, great question. And this concludes today's hearing. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions. So Ms. Bush, you can submit your last question for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.